one idea that really appealed to me quite strongly was the notion of science juxtaposed with the supernatural constantly in all of the frames of this opera and how they come together. And then when we were discussing this, what made this even more interesting was being told what the concept would be, and that was this idea of putting Hoffmann in a turn of the century to the 20th century circus, which I thought was fascinating because in many ways there's a, an interesting dovetailing of all of these ideas coming together at once. And a circus, I thought, wow, is that not a perfect idea? Because that really just sort of feeds to the idea of what's weird and fantastical and out there in the supernatural. But it's almost, in a way, a supernatural dialogue with the scientific, how they both come together at the same time. So what I thought I would do is take you through a small presentation about all of these ideas without necessarily touching too, too much on the circus. I think the circus is there so that uh, the wonderful Camelia Koo can actually talk to you about that a bit more rather than me, because this is her set design and these are her costumes, and I'm very excited about the sorts of things that she's going to speak to you about after I've finished. So let's, um, let's just push on and see what there is to see in these really remarkable um, in these uh, slides that I found that I want to put up for you. This, of course, is Offenbach, a man of his times, very much, who uh, died um, before he could actually complete this opera, as many of you know in your notes, and I think in many ways was very, very much influenced by the supernatural, as most everyone was. And the 19th century was an era of the fantastical and of the remarkable, the supernatural. Anything, in fact, involved in the above and the beyond so it wasn't just an era of wearing your heart on your sleeve. It wasn't just an era of the overarching emotional dynamic of the literary and artistic life. It had some kind of permeation or movement into something transcendental. Romanticism with a capital R always means above and beyond the normal. That is the writ large life. And that's what makes, I think, romanticism very interesting for me always to study, and a constant a uh, suffused theme with that, always, to me at any rate, that reminds me of this, is ghost stories and things that take us into the realm of the beyond. This is constant. So, Offenbach was greatly influenced by this. He read widely. Uh, he knew uh, this literature. He was not just a man who wrote comic operas, opera bouffe. He wanted to actually prove at the end of his life that he could write a very serious and not necessarily tragic, but still potentially magnum opus that could bring all of his styles, his features of writing music, and his literary references to bear in one source. So Offenbach is an interesting man, and not just a one-off. He is actually a very, very skilled composer. And I think in this way, that's what makes him interesting for study. So, here we are in Paris. Uh, these are um, beautiful postcards of the uh, Paris World's Fair, 1889. So the end of the decade when Hoffmann is, is of course, um, premiered. And to me, really, the relevance of this is extraordinary. I realize that this is out of sync by nine years, eight, nine years, but you know, that doesn't matter because what informs this world, the steam power generators, the, hey, look, we've got a real command of material science, we call it the Eiffel Tower. You know, this is the tallest structure in the world. Beat that. Well, of course, the Americans took it personally, and you know what they did after that, right? And moving sidewalks. Did you know there were moving sidewalks in 1889? Yeah. They were right there, out in front, actually, um, around that perimeter, which is where all of the International Pavilion was, just beneath the Eiffel Tower. An age of rationality. We always think science invented in the 19th century. It was the coming age of humanity, right? It was an era of complete and total rationalism, right? Well, wrong. Um, it was also <laughs> an era of ghosts. And uh, if we actually just go clockwise, we have fairies at the top, and we have ghosts, and we can't forget the Flying Dutchman, uh, which is the ultimate ghost story and opera of all time. And moving around, of course, we have a ghost sort of appearing on the stairs. And just in the bottom panels, too, uh, that's a, on, just on the left, is a newspaper description for um, a series of ghost stories that they're going to run in their, in their newspaper, which is a very, very common thing to do. And then in the lower right, actually how the ghost stories and the ghosts are, are done, and that's, of course, this is Popper's projection, which I really, really love. So as I'm projecting like a ghost, 
he's projecting here, which of course is mirror reflected and then astonishes this poor fellow who's sitting at the table. And these kinds of tricks, these hoaxes, were very, very normal in the 19th century. It went unexplained. People tried to explain them. Of course, the, the joke was on everybody in that they were never explained, well, almost never, until finally somebody was forced to, to explain it in some way. So science, of course, this was a great time for discovery, and what a list of accomplishments. I mean, to me, without a doubt, for those of you who are scientists in the audience, can there be any doubt? Who here is a, a scientist or an engineer? here in the audience. Okay, please, please support me on this. Is there any doubt the greatest accomplishment in the 19th century is Faraday, really? The greatest scientist has to be Faraday, leading to Maxwell's great four equations, right? And then from there, we can move to a whole host of wonderful science to do with the cathode ray tube, and then eventually to Lorentz's equations, and then what do we get after that? After Lorentz transformation in 1906, we get Einstein. We get relativity, which is a 19th century phenomenon, even though it's a 20th century, technically, a discovery. But it's directly out of the product of 19th century science. And that's why I'm fascinated with this, because this is super saturating the culture, but it's massively misunderstood. It's almost like science today. You know, I mean, it's, it's remarkable, especially coming from a neuroscience background, how much the word neurobabble has become a very, very important turn to coin. There's so much in the press of you know, how we take a brain study out of context and then suddenly you know, we do this one thing and it makes our brain bigger or something or we get smarter. There's all kinds of this sort of misalignment and miscommunication that exists between science and either pseudoscience, non-science, popular culture, or in the 19th century, the supernatural. So this is kind of a, I'm sorry for the blurriness of the image, but there's many identifiable tools of the trade, a photovoltaic pile just on the left, which is hard to see, um, a tube, what looks like a, a primitive, um, well, a very, very primitive centrifuge on the right, and a whole variety of other things that look like a very, very typical physicist bench. So it's got kind of the trappings and the tools of the trade, the chaos that people would have viewed as being what science was like. And the chaotic bench, of course, continues with uh, actually Faraday's lab. And what are all the bottles? Faraday was no mere physicist, he was an electric chemist too. He had a remarkable command of chemistry. And in fact, he found numerous new compounds, which makes him a very, very interesting person just for that alone, even before we actually go to his uh, workings in um, electromagnetism. And here's a better color uh, shot that I really want to include with him on the left, a little bit more clearly refined. But what an amazing space that is. And of course, also, I should uh, point out too, excuse me, but uh, you can see also, uh, perhaps on the bench, a little bit blurry, um, you could probably, in the earlier slide, you could see a Bunsen burner, which is something that he actually popularized. Uh, this is, um, I love this, this is actually supposed to be um, uh, a basement laboratory in Duke uh, University, which got used by Universal Studios. <laughs> and of course, Duke is about the southernmost place where the Ivy League actually goes. And this is kind of an old-fashioned basement lab that got photoshopped with a couple of people in it looking like they were doing science-y things where things explode. And it's actually at that time when that projection was made that scientists finally figured out, hey, there's, there's some sort of particulate that moves in a straight line that can make this. Well, that's really exciting. If you can get fluorescence like that and make that, then suddenly you're onto something very, very new and you're onto something that actually is going to take you to understand a little bit more about particles, waves, light, and how matter works. So this was a time for that rationality, but it was also a time to mix that with ghost stories. And I mean, if we sort of look at these rather sort of uh, spooky sort of lab surroundings and uh, these unexplained explosions that can take place from harnessing this sort of power, and harnessing uh, the use of those uh, ionized gases, and it's really not far until we get Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And this is, of course, the ultimate book that is now considered by literary scholars, and appropriately so, to be the first great work of science fiction. And in that domain, many things get launched that affect our opera. This is a very important slide. And the reason it's important is because in so many respects, you have the science fiction, but you also have the moral domain of what it is to create a creature who actually can be given 
such power and then can give in to actions that would have been considered, and even by us today, to be considered absolutely immoral, such as to suddenly murder somebody because one is angry, or one has an instinct for, for vengeance. And then, of course, as we know in this great story, the monster, as he's called, convinces Victor to actually make a mate for him. But he cannot carry the act to completion and destroys the mate, thinking that, oh my gosh, I could breed a race of people you know, who have these, these instincts. So there is a cross between what, are the, what is the moral imperative of science, what is science for, to this kind of supernatural science fiction, the impossible of creating this sort of creature, and trying to reconcile what those passions might be inside that creature. So this was a constant topic of discussion for this kind of literature. And it was only a matter of time before it would spawn a new kind of literature called the Gothic. So not only is there the fantastical involved in this, very, very typical. For those of us who love music here, how many know Schubert's Earl King? The song Earl King, right? So this is 1815. The 18-year-old Schubert creates this amazing song from an old German legend that Goethe retells in poetic form about a boy who's kidnapped by the king of the elves. And he sees the elf king coming closer and closer and tries to warn his father, but his father can't see it. And so finally the boy is taken away. So the classic ghost story, the classic fantastical legend, merges to eventually become a chief literary strain of the supernatural called the Gothic Romance. And this is why I think when we see sort of the cut line to Edmonton Opera, it says, come join us for a dark fairy tale under the big top. Right? This is very appropriate. Because the dark fairy tale is exactly, I believe, what Offenbach is trying to take from his librettus, from the play that would have been written in mid-century, when the Gothic became absolutely explosive. And all from these early century influences, another great early century influence would, of course, have been Berlioz and the Symphonie Fantastique, which is really a touchstone for many other works of similar nature. And this is, of course, inspired by the De Goya painting of the witch's Sabbath, really the witch's orgy. And the fifth movement of Symphony Fantastique is, in fact, that witch's round dance, that dance of the witch's Sabbath. And this was actually also re-popularized around 1828. Barely was Symphony Fantastique is 1830. So the impact of this sort of thing was tremendous as well. Not only that, but we're going, to, we're going to keep on coming back to that because uh, Dr. Suidad Ravi is going to actually ex express this sort of history of the fantastical in French literature. But even in these early times, I'm actually hoping that uh, Dr. Mitterbauer is also going to talk a little bit about this because one of the Hoffman stories that's of great interest is the automaton, which of course we know pertains to Olympia. But it was a pairic story, wasn't it? With the vampire, Der Vampir. And the vampire actually got turned into an opera about three or four times. And we remember almost none of those versions, except for uh, one that is really actually quite curious. And believe it or not, the Quebec Summer Opera Program put on Der Vampire in 2011. It was quite a real hit. But it is really an interesting sort of um, resurrection of what would have been a fascination with this new uh, and interesting uh, Gothic turn that would actually pertain to the romantic imagination or would actually appeal to it a great deal. And then, of course, this is another um, uh, very, very famous photograph. It's called the Spirit Photograph. And when this came out in around mid-century, I believe, this was a, a remarkable, uh, it was a tremendous hoax, of course. It's really closer to the daguerreotype. And, um, well, I think we all know what it is. It's, re it's merely double exposure. <laughs> This was really the first great use of, uh, intentional use of double exposure on a popular scale that went rampant all over Europe and had legions of people speculating that there were such things as ghosts, which people really, really did want to believe in. And this was, of course, the 19th century need for that as well. So it wasn't a matter, too, when this dialogue came up, say, at royal societies, and they would talk about, are there such things as ghosts? You know, is this actually real or not? They were interested not so much in what we would talk of saying, well, a naturalist explanation would be that your brain fools you because of this particular condition of light and contrast adaptation, 
and part of your parietal lobe likes to take all of these images and make sense of what the visual cortex is feeding it, da 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 da. You know, we, they weren't thinking of that. What they were thinking of was, well, it's not a question of whether they're real or not. The question is more, what can science do to explain that they're real? That was what they were really interested in. And very few people were actually saying, they're not real at all, and I'm not interested in this. But eventually, by the end of the century, people did start to say that. By the end of the 19th century, they were actually more standing up to this and saying, you know, it's not so much that we're interested in reality or illusion. I think we can just safely divide it. The, the supernatural is part of religion, and science is part of science. And we inherit that decision, the mantle of that decision that was made around the 1890s to the early 1900s. That's the origin of that thought that makes us all rationalists, more or less, in this room. That's when it comes back. But it's not, strictly speaking, a 19th century phenomenon to think that way. So, on to Hoffmann now itself, and to actually talk a bit about it. Um, I've decided not to go into a really, really dry plot summary, because I think you've all read it. I mean, how many people here know the plot of Hoffman, more or less? You must have. That's just about everybody. So, briefly, Hoffman is a story of four women and four loves and an author. Hoffman is um, the name taken from E.T.A. Hoffman, who published many of these stories in the early 19th century, which Dr. Bitterbauer will go into in greater detail. And I have read these stories, as I said to Dr. Bitterbauer on the phone, I read these as an undergrad, and they fascinated me, and I never forgot them, which is why when the opera came along and I was introduced to the opera, I was just really taken with it, and how these stories transformed from the beginning of the century in the hands of German Romanticism. And we must always acknowledge that Romanticism is a German invention in terms of literature. And then, in the hands of French Romanticism, becomes something really quite different. So there's like three time points. Around 1815, 1820, Hoffman. 1850, the arrival of the play, Tales of Hoffman. And then by 1880, 30 years thence, again, we have sort of the French creation of this in operatic form. And it goes through some interesting transformations, which I think should be left to our literary scholars to explain better than I can. Regardless, what comes out of this is a very singular message. Hoffmann is urged to say about his loves. Hoffmann does not have much self-esteem, particularly. He is not a very successful writer. Neither was the real E.T.A. Hoffmann, in fact, in some ways. Actually, E.T.A. Hoffmann was a real polymath. He loved music, he loved criticism, he loved writing about a whole variety of things. But our Hoffmann in this um, sings about his stunted, reduced character in the Kleinsach aria, which is one of my favorite pieces in the prelude. And then he goes into a reverie, because he's only thinking about this woman he's in love with named Stella. And from that outgrowth comes his fascination, his own sort of inner exploration through time of the women that he has fallen in love with. And Camille will talk about that, I think, a little bit more, hopefully, when she explains um, the wonderful uh, set model that she has made up uh, just here at stage right. And so the, the beauty of this is that each woman, each incarnation, he falls in love with a doll named Olympia, who's not real at all, she's an automaton, and embarrasses himself horribly by trying to dance with her and believing that she's real. And why? Because as the villain of the act, and indeed the villain who is always the villain, Every act is played by the same person. This is not why I wore black. I'm not the villain. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to make any kind of representative statement tonight. That's why I have to choose gray. If like, you don't have any contrast, I mean, they're, they're not going to get this. Okay, sorry. But the idea is that each act, typically the sopranos are played by the same, the, the, the female leads are usually played by the same person. Well, this is not the case in our production, but certainly the villain is played by the same person. And he keeps coming back in the stories to frustrate Hoffman's attempt to fall in love. Because in real life, that man is also attempting to frustrate Hoffman from pursuing Stella, because he wants Stella for himself. So he always finds a way to humiliate Hoffman and accidentally, unwittingly bring him to realization. 
but really he has no interest. He has absolutely no altruistic interest. The altruistic interest is a supernatural one named Nicolaus, who is portrayed variously as a sprite, as a spirit, as a flesh and blood living person, as a variety of things, the muse, disguised as one of Hoffmann's students. And Nicolaus's role is actually to bring Hoffmann to the realization that through Olympia the doll, the mechanical, you know, the sort of the animalistic attraction. Finally, the socialite, Julieta, with all of her riches and her splendor, her poise in public, that these are all shadowy types. They are all archetypes, as Carl Jung would have said, of something much deeper in him that he really wants. And what is that thing? But that those four women, in fact, stand for, ultimately, <coughs> something much, much higher that Nicholas is really trying to urge him on to get to in his life. And there are ways in this production that Nicholas really, um, it seems deleteriously, but really in the end, not so. It's quite um, uh, an adjuvant. That is, uh, it gives him new life to realize what his role is, and that is to fall in love with art. That the only marriage that a man like Hoffman can make is to art itself. So there are various ways in which this can be shown scientifically and supernaturally. And uh, one of those, of course, is uh, the only way that you know, any, any of us can really sort of fall in love with a doll and be convinced that it's real is that we're wearing rose-colored glasses. So Coppelius, not only does the villain makes these lifelike eyeballs, and you've got to see the eyeballs in this production. Can I just encourage you all to flood Amazon and get this? This is the 1951 movie version of Tales of Hoffman. Good gracious, it's magnificent. It is a classic work of art. I highly recommend it. Just absolutely wonderful. The Powell and Pressburger is the essential art house. It's fully danced. Um, it's, it's absolutely stunning. It's opulent in every single scene, every camera angle. And I really, really do encourage this. And it's wonderful to see the Coppelius in this version, sort of opening his coat and his eyeballs everywhere. You know, and he's got eyeballs in his hand, and they're all blinking at you, you know, it's, it's just perfect. But he's not only a manufacturer of eyes and change of perspective, a way that the eyes then become uh, sort of driven with the supernatural, the scientific. But you see, he's working in a lab of Spallanzani, and I don't want to really give all the plot away of that relationship and how spoiled it becomes, but that really, this is kind of the science lab place where weird science takes place and Olympia is brought to life. And my goodness, does she ever remind you of Mary Shelley and the Bride of Frankenstein? And you know, this is really, really quite telling. But before we get to that, consider that our rose-colored glasses change your perspective so that you can actually see something that's not there. And it isn't a good thing. It's the thing that you see inside that you want to see. And hence the animalistic idea that I love, you know, sort of the instinctual and our dog with rose-colored glasses on the left. But even the sense, too, that, you know, these glasses are so powerful, folks, they can even bring the dead to life. They can make life appear where there is none, which is exactly what happens with Olympia. And this is another kind of sort of weird resurrectionist science that was also a strange undercurrent in, in you know, in, in the time. And it's all Frankensteinian in descent as well. So all kinds of ideas that are being used here that I think are very, very important as currents and can take us very interestingly and very quickly into the Gothic side. And this is, I think, remarkable that a tale, whether Gothic or heroic, is still in the imagination, in the beyond. And it's a very, very rich informing source. And it's also going to inform Eugene and Jäger as well because our heroine, Tatiana, is going to be inspired by the same kinds of beyond tales of the heroic when she reads Richardson's novels as inspired by her cousin removed through her mother to read these things. And that will give her the life that eventually she's going to wind up having by Act Three in that wonderful opera. So this is a very, very strong current all throughout the 19th century is that these tales really give us and give our characters definition and inspiration and raison d'être for a living. And here is the COC production. I'm sorry this is so grainy, but if you look in the back, you can sort of see the case, you know, where Olympia lay, and you can sort of see the usual weird science, you know, the, the tubes as well. 
And the COC, when they did this, and I loved seeing this production, um, and, and the, the, the tall wig as well for our Frankenstein and Olympia. So it's not just so much that she's got a key that gets turned traditionally so that she can then walk around the stage and then sing cette chanson d'amour and then sings this wonderful sort of, you know, which is of course deliciously ironic. She's singing about this is a love song, ha 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 you know, and it's anything but a love song. It's just a mechanical trope. That's all. She's been programmed to sing it, and that's so she can interest buyers who, of course, will, um, of course, fund Spallanzani's lab, right? And that's, that's, of course, the corruption part of that, which is very interesting, showing that undercurrent of science is always being on the edge of being broke. And yet, it combines with the Frankensteinian weird science as well. And I think the COC read that beautifully, and I thought they combined it really rather beautifully in that scene. Now, here's Kate Lindsay as the muse in the Met version with uh, Yosef Kalai and Anna Trebko. This is an outstanding version. I highly recommend it. It's so good that you can't get it anymore. So I'm just trusting that they're going to reissue this thing on Blu-ray uh, because that must be what's going on. I don't know why, but you know what? It's going to be the definitive Hoffman. You know, it's going to replace the Domingo version. And well, I mean, there's so many CD versions too. I mean, if some of you are Hoffman fans, there's just some outstanding CD recordings, but. Videos in the traditional sense of what's been going on the last three years are kind of harder to come by in super abundant numbers. So the one that you would want the most, you can't get. So watch your Met Opera store for this being reissued. It just has to be reissued because it's too good not to. But you see all the multiple dolls on stage there? You know, in, in one version, for example, in this one, I was, I was saying um, to Camellia, uh, at the end, the buyers are all dolls too. And <laughs> so there's kind of this really weird kind of mechanical clapping at the end of her of her aria, which is really quite stunning. <clears throat> so um, sorry, I skipped. So here uh, is Antonia's scene. Antonia is haunted by her mother's spirit. She cannot sing because if she sings, she will die. And Doctor Miracle, who's the other villain, ensures that that happens by telling her, "You can have a career. You can sing. Don't worry about your father." And of course, uh, this is the story about Crespel, and Crespel is disheartened and blames Hoffman, actually, instead of Dr. Miracle, though he doesn't like Miracle at all and tries to throw him out for his quackery and his poor So Another feature, of course, that can really dog um, 19th century science is that medicine did not have a very, very good uh, reputation. And then finally, in the last panel, we have Venice, and this is, in fact, I think my last slide, uh, we have Venice the Extravagant, the Flamboyant, in fact, everything that Julianna stands for. Um, it's uh, really not only just the fantastical, but the giant mirror represents that great place where you can go and lose your own soul. You know, it's not just about Newton's optics anymore and how to use mirrors intelligently, and you know, how telescopes improved a great deal in the 19th century as well. It's not just that science, but it's the downside of it, that it's still that strange place where you can lose your very reflection. So a mirror has that standpoint, too, of being the place where the soul no longer can reflect because it's been lost in something else. Though not pointedly in this panel because of science. This is probably the least scientific of the three in its drive, but yet in some ways the most occultish. And there's many ways as well to talk about it. If you've got questions about that, I'd be really, really glad to, to answer those. So, in some ways, um, when we look at this, it's the Faustian bargain gone wrong. You know, you make the bargain with science, you make the bargain to grow and to change, and it doesn't work somehow. The supernatural and the scientific are paired. It's not clear in the 19th century in literature which one is more influential than the other. They both simply run together in parallel. And I think in so many ways, this is what runs parallel as well with the Three Ring Circus that is Hoffman's life. His loves are kind of a circus, like the supernatural and the scientific, that are so unconventionally mixed that the public can't really separate one from the other as clearly as they would like. So Stella, in the end, where it begins as the four, one of the four loves, Stella is the one you would think who would make 
the identity of science and supernatural come together, but in fact it's not. It's Niklaus's muse. And that is, I think, really the fitting way for this to end, that the four loves and the essential three-ring circus, the duality of science and the supernatural, can only find a unity in art for him. And Niklaus convinces him that the only real marriage that he can make to resolve all of this is to be married to her, his most jealous love of all time. And that's really the happy ending, is that when we find love, we find our truest and deepest calling. Thanks very much. <laughs>